Aloha, welcome to Pacific Leaders Today, a podcast from the East-West Center dedicated to young leaders from the Pacific. This portion of the series focuses on alumni of the Pacific Island Leadership Program, an East-West Center program that seeks to build leaders dedicated to shaping the future prosperity of the Pacific region by taking informed, effective action and is founded by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of China, Taiwan. For this first episode, I'm having a conversation with Neti from Papua New Guinea. Neti tells us about her leadership journey and specifically about how she's helping women find their voices in her country. Neti, uh, welcome. Hello. How are you? Hello. I'm good, thanks, Philippi. I'm doing great. I hope you are too. I am. Thank you very much. Uh, so my first question is a very easy one, uh, but can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, where do you come from and what are you doing uh, with your life right now? All right. Um, I come from Papua New Guinea. Uh, I am a lawyer, still am one. It's just that I moved from, I was, just, I was working for about five and a half years with government, particularly with law reform legislative reform in Papua New Guinea that's since coming out from law school and as of May last year I had transitioned to work with the bank in the areas of legal compliance and um, other community engagement as well as part of the bank's program and um, I have a kid I have a child I have one baby um, and at the moment yeah I'm working with the bank and I had a lot of things else going on, but um, that's as far as I can say. And I was part of the cohort in 2017, G5. That's about it. Mm. Yeah, so indeed you are a former participant of the Pacific Island Leadership Program yes. uh, run by East West Center and funded by Taiwan. So uh, about this program and, and you attending it, uh, can you tell us why did you decide to participate and, and how did it impact you eventually? All right. Um, my The reason why I had participated with, for, uh, in the health program in the year that I did was um, I had initially, like, as part of my job, I traveled throughout the region doing um, law reform work, but not me- necessarily. It was basically on research on what the rest of the Pacific, like, rest of the region was doing with certain um, pieces of legislation, especially the ones with, that were dealing with women and children and other um, human rights or, yeah, other human rights causes. So when that happened and my interest grew in the area of human rights, um, when the opportunity came to participate, I mean, when the call came out for Pacific Islanders to apply for the PILT program, like I felt that that was a really good platform where I could be a part of and learn from other um, Pacific Island participants, not only learn from them, but also share my experience from PNG. So it was more of a learning curve for me. Mm-hmm. And also, on the other hand, it was for me to see what the rest of the world was doing as a region, not necessarily the other parts of the world, but what the region was doing and what were the priority areas in this region and how they were going about it. Because there was not so much collaboration within the Pacific. Like we only had the Pacific Island Forum and um, the Melanesian Spearhead Groups. And this, this um, conventions happen at like certain years. Like they have, they're, and they're not really annual events, but it comes out at the time when they're scheduled, either by annually or after four years. And discussions are made at that level, but they're not followed through till the next meeting is done. So there wasn't that much collaboration within the region. And because maybe like for my previous thought was maybe because we had different agendas, that's why. So I wanted to be a part of that group to at least learn what was it that was a common um, agenda. So then being in government, like in government in policy making and legislative reform, like we could push those agendas out. And if other people saw what we were doing here in PNG, they'd want to be on board because that is what they're also, what these are probably the same issues they were facing in their country. So that was like the whole, the biggest scheme of things of why um, I wanted to be a part of this group. 
besides of course like traveling and mm. seeing other parts of the world as well yeah awesome and so you've attended a, a leadership program so i'm guessing that you see yourself as a leader so how would you describe yourself as a leader and why um i would say like leadership my initial idea of being a leader before going in there was totally different like now after the program and everything and the experiences like learning from what i know now to what i know then like leadership is transformational it depends on the time and the era what leadership that my dad had been practicing and his dad has been practicing is totally different from like now that i am in here i'm born in this era and i live not from i live in the city and not from my community so the way we do things here is totally different from what my grandfather did and my dad did in his time so um what like basically it's just that uh, like to me being a leader is not just being educated and knowing a lot of things and stuff it's how how best we can group people like bring people together like how best you bring people together and maintain their togetherness like that to me is very challenging and that is it takes skill and if somebody can do that then like you are deemed as a leader in in this community in this time and from where i'm from like cuz leadership here maybe the principle still stands because you you go before and you lead for your people but it stems from different communities like different communities view people differently and then they are like they say that oh this is our leader because this person does that this this for us it could be different from another community so it's transformational depending on where you are and what time it is like what era it is so that's how mm. that's how i came out of the training like when i came out of the training that's how i viewed leadership you find a course that's important to you and you gather people who are affected by it or also have the same um passion or also fight for the same cause and then once you group those people and you start speaking for and on behalf of them or with them then that is what leadership is like because you cannot solve the world issues you can only solve what you're passionate about or what is more important to you so that's how yeah. um and then, i see yeah. this yeah interesting so if i understand you correctly uh leadership is highly contextual and so in what way do you see this uh, conversation around leadership as such an important topic in this this uh, specific region that is the pacific Okay um at this time sorry can you just repeat your question if i didn't get the last bit Yes um so as as i if i understand you correctly uh, leadership is highly contextual so i'm guessing in yeah. the pacific it has a different flavor to uh, to it and so how why is it so important to talk about leadership in the context of the pacific um because the at the moment like why it's highly contextual is because people are like they want to see tangible stuff right like we can say that oh we will do this and it'll happen in time people do not have the patience we have climate change that's adorning on us and we have other issues that are affecting our daily lives and being developing or developed or still emerging developing countries sitting and trying to um discuss leadership in all its principles is according to many people is i wouldn't say it's a waste of time maybe to us the educated people because we want the principles to better our leadership skills but to the people that were leading they're not they're not here to listen to our tales of how leaders leaders should act or how how a leader should conduct himself they want to see tangible results so as a leader it is stressful and it's a pressure on you to show your people that yes this is what's happening this is what we're doing see we did this and this is what we're getting they want to see results there and then and it's very stressful and very challenging to try to meet the demand because once you are a leader people expect results and if you if you do not mm. produce the results within a time frame according to their time frame you can like for example here in in this in, in papua new guinea the um accounts the png finance accounts closes in november so i'll just give a typical example of what happened to us in my 
community, the community that I grew up in, where my parents lived. So um, they had asked for, our sitting member had asked for like woman group and stuff like that. It's probably part of his own political campaign for next year. But anyway, that's besides the point. So he had called all the women like within his constituency to register groups. So that's what we did because I belong to the community. I literally lived my entire life there before living. So we had gone back and created this community. But this community, I mean communities rather, this association, this association was, it's a long, it was a long journey since 2016, even before I went to PILT. So there was a struggle. There were only a minority of mothers who had been carrying on this, um, this job of trying to register the group, trying to convene the people. And then it was just, uh, it was just another struggle for them because they were not as educated as we were. So they did what they did best during that time. Anyway, so when that happened, and then the minister came up with the promise, probably in the 2017 elections, he said that he was going to um, dish out SME money, which is the small medium enterprise funding grant, to all these women groups to actually carry out projects to sustain their lives. So that promise was kept in 2017. So when the minister promised that the leaders, meaning because my aunt and my mom were the leading mothers within this group, like I had to support them. So then people look to me and think that, oh, Nathie, she's in the government. So the pressure was on, like they, thinking that they, since I'm with the government, it was easy for me to access that funding. But no, there are processes and procedures in place. So when that wasn't coming in, man, the pork on the street, like they made up their own rumor saying that we got the money and we ate it. But man, there are processes in place. And then when November came, the accounts closed. We cannot access any funding from the government. And then there has been the case 2017 to just 2021, the year before the next election, mm. the minister came through on his promise. And all these mothers who just gave up hope on us, faith in my aunt and my, my big sister, my aunt and my mom and me, like they left us for a good three years. And then when they heard that the money was coming in, all of a sudden they all came out from the caves and they came to our house. So just giving that example, people want to see tangible results. Once they know that you're you're in a position where you can get things done. Then you must get things done. Because if you don't, they easily lose trust because we have other things going on. We are trying to survive every day. Corruption, crime, climate change. They don't have time to sit back and listen to the tales of leaders, what you will bring to the table, how you're going to bring it. No, you just bring it. You say you're going to do it, you just bring it. So that's the current, if you're trying to lead this current generation, which like it's passing from their parents to them, that's what it is. Mm. So basically going to more action-oriented leadership than position-based exactly. leadership, right? Yes, yes. Mm. Yeah, I see. And so given what you described and, and this shift in, in the expectation of the population, how can uh, we make sure that the region, the Pacific region, is ready for the future challenges that you just talked about, knowing the context that you just described? Um, the main thing is, some form of literacy, any form of educational or financial literacy. People need to know that some of these things are beyond us, like they're beyond them too. There are processes in place and these processes take time. It's not like if you're trying to register a group, you cannot just like, for some countries it takes, a, I mean, a while. Like here, in the, even in the city, the process of registering a legal group in trying to be a legally um, recognized group, there are processes in place, and those processes take weeks, months, even years. And it costs money. The waiting costs money. And people need to be educated to understand that these things are because the rate of illiteracy is causing all of this mayhem. One side of the group is literate, they understand what's going on, and they're pushing for betterness. While the others who are semi-illiterate, who probably just know how to speak English and add 1 to 10, are the ones that are slowing us down in trying to understand what the process are in place for us to go about, move along with, and get things done. So basically, like, for my um, personal take on it, it's the level of, illiteracy, level of literacy in, in our countries. And especially when it comes to mm. women, Women have a highest rate of illiteracy right now at the community level. And these women, when they're girls, 
if they're not educated to a certain, I mean, basic education is fine, but it only teaches you A, a to Z. You need an added form of education to actually assist you in life, life in general. So 12 years of education mm-hmm. for us Papua New Guinea is vital. Hmm. So that's, do you think it's even more it important is. knowing knowing the complexity of the challenges that we are facing? You talked about climate change, you talk about corruption and all that. Those are very complex challenges to take up on. And so do you think that makes literacy and, and helping people to understand all that uh, even more important? Yes, I do. Like They, they need to be updated and, on everything that's happening around them. Many say that, but that is remaining oblivious to the cause. But these things you can say it doesn't bother you or that you don't care about it, but it does indirectly affect all of us, regardless to who we are and what we do. We're living in this whole um in this country and every anything and everything will affect us, either directly or indirectly. So people need to be mm. educated first before they start knowing all these other things because it requires some level of education. Indeed, and that's the responsibility of leaders to kind of encourage people to to yes. reach to this um, education. Yeah, yeah. Right. Somehow so, they so just knowing to... knowing all that. Yep. Sorry, go for it. No, I said like it's that's the that's the thing that every leader, whether you're in the parliament or community level, like those. That's the thing we have to encourage that parents like. If you didn't get the education that you were supposed to get when you were a kid, like now is your time to educate your son or your daughter so they do not end up like you not understanding what's happening around you. So that's the yeah. advice that we usually tell the parents in our community. Hmm, interesting. And so, well, that leads perfectly to, to my last question for you, Neti. Uh, if you had to give any advice or recommendation or just simply sharing something that is important for you, uh, for people to listen uh, in the Pacific right now, what would you like to tell them? Um, there is collectiveness, like collectiveness in the voices if everyone works together. Like uh, we've tried, we've tried to just be a, group of family only trying to move change in our country uh, our country rather move change in our community and that didn't work we were only getting bettering ourselves but the rest of our people were not getting far so there is power in the collective by the time you influence one family then it influences the rest of the community as well and i can never stress this enough like education Initially, when I went to PILP, I just thought, like, education is a privilege, fine. Like, leadership, so long as you people, you have, you have people in the same group who fight for the same cause, that's fine. But you can have the people in the same group fighting for the same cause. But if they do not have the level of understanding that you have, or at least understand what's going on, then they're just a load of baggage you're just dragging on when they're not understanding what you're fighting for, whatever your cause is. So as much as possible... We have to instill this idea in our people. It doesn't have to be like the formal education. Like many people, maybe for the children, yes. But for the ones who have already left school a long time ago, there's adult matriculation. So long as you know how to read and understand, articulate the English language, which is the universal language of the world, then that's better. You're updated every time. And then awareness, be aware of things that are happening around you. Then only these people, our mm. people and us, we can all contribute effectively. So togetherness is the way forward for us as a region. You can start in your home and your family and then a community of people in your own community. And then that builds on from there. It becomes a network of other communities and that's the way we move. And then we can move our governments for this more co- collaborative effort. Because right now there's none of that existing. We have forums, but those forums are just there to display. I don't know. I haven't attended any of those forums. I cannot speak on that, but I'm hoping to attend soon. So mm-hmm. that's it. Nice. That's it there, for me. There's there's a word uh, that comes to mind when I listen to you on this recommendation, whether uh, working together while being open to others and, and educating is like really the world curiosity. So do you think that could be like the core element of your of your recommendation is to be curious? 
Yes, definitely. Yes, yes. Just curious. We wanting yeah, to right. change for the better. Many a times we're like timid to change, but change is is more good than is bad. If people saw it that way, and that it there's always room for um growth. It's like we when there's something goes wrong somewhere. It's like the whole thing collapses. Like we don't see the advantages of why things happen. It's better to be a step ahead than what we were the day before, the year before, ten years before. It's better to have made progress, mm. some sort of progress. Indeed. Well, Niti, thank you very much for your insight and your your wisdom on uh, leadership in the, in the Pacific. And uh, good luck to you. Thank you. Good luck to everyone else too. Pacific Leaders Today is the podcast produced by the East West Center, a nonprofit organization that promotes better relations and understanding among the people and nations of the United States, Asia, and the Pacific through cooperative study, research, and dialogue. For more information on the center and its leadership programs, go visit eastwestcenter.org. Mahalo, and I'll see you soon for another episode.